uh, on our own to make a change in this destination. And that's really, really difficult for me to face because all my life I've been an unflappable optimist. But now it would be easy to fall into fearfulness and hopelessness. For me, that would feel like a betrayal of my spiritual ancestors, struggled against ancestors who struggled against slavery and the rule by monarchs and for universal suffrage, secular, the secular state for peace, for decent wages in a safe workplace, and in more contemporary times for human and civil rights for all, and still more recently for justice for our Aboriginal sisters and brothers. So he now I swear that my name will not be found on the wall of shame, that record which will show who has failed to warn what is coming if we continue to damage the earth and continue by continuing to mine, refine, transport, and selling or supplying carbon fuels for burning. And it's not just warning at this time that uh, warning at this time that we're uh, um, faced with when we're faced by those who lie, smear, say we have no choice, and all while taking profits. But I will also support those who work for change in our socioeconomic structures and to reprioritize our values. And I will stand with those who resist the destruction of Earth. I will be bold and fervent and generous and loving because I can't be otherwise. I made a point of not trying to figure out who you guys are. I've not done any search at all. I know nothing about your backgrounds or your education, your careers, your families, or what you bring to this process. In another time and place, it would have been so much, I would have felt so much better if I'd been able to speak to you all, per, all personally and let you see who I am and to have an open exchange uh, where we could search out our common experiences and the values that we share. But that's, that process isn't open to us. So what I'm left with is, is this opportunity to speak to you quietly now and in this moment and ask you to search your own souls and to look closely at your children, the children in your families, and to into their futures, and to leave room for the conclusion that you want your name to be included on that other wall that is the one that records those who decided to save our coasts, our fish, our sacred headwaters, the air that we all need to breathe and preserve the climate that we all need to survive to sustain us and the one where our children and their children will flourish. So I've come to ask you, to ask that you please not recommend the approval of this pipeline. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Stephen. Um, please go ahead and share your views on the project with us. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and for all your work. I, I was thinking the other day about the patience and stamina it must take to do what you're doing for so long. Uh, we're grateful. I acknowledge that we're meeting on unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. I imagine their ancestors must be dismayed to see the changes that have occurred around this place. I'd like to begin by building some context ahead of the points that I'm really here to say, a little bit about why I've come to be saying the things that I, that I came to say. When I first registered to speak before the panel, I had pretty grand ideas about what I would say uh, about the project. I wanted to talk about it in terms of the direction of development that it represents, uh, broader energy policy and climate change. I was disappointed to learn that despite a definition of environment that includes land, water, and air, and despite a list of factors to be considered that includes environmental, uh, cumulative environmental effects uh, in combination with other projects and activities, um, but the panel had, is not able to look at these issues in the broader scope of sort of the two ends of this pipeline, uh, the tar sands and the climate change from the use of the fossil fuels. Uh, we see the same sort of thing here in BC with the siting of net pen salmon farms where they look at the location of a farm in individually and, and, and no one looks at the cumulative effect of, of the farms up and down the coast or the complete systems that they're operating in. 
Uh, I don't know. I don't understand why we evaluate things under these narrow spotlights instead of in the full light of day. But uh, being unable to change it, I, I narrowed the scope of what I would uh, speak on. So I started building an argument around the economic aspects of the project. But as the hearings progressed, I saw people far more qualified than myself even today uh, speaking to those aspects. Uh, so next, I thought about the safety aspects of it. Uh, we know that running tankers in and out of narrow waterways is, is not safe. Our government knows that. That's why in February 2007, Canada's ambassador to the U.S. delivered a diplomatic note to the U.S. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission saying that Canada would not permit tankers to sail the passage between New, New Brunswick's Deer and Campobello Islands. This was reiterated in 2010 by the Canadian consulate in Boston that Canada would not allow fuel tankers through that channel because of concerns over the potential impact of a spill. The narrowest point uh, there is actually between Campobello Island and a small island called Indian Island. Uh, no doubt somebody could just remove that little island, but as it sits, uh, looking at Google Maps with their distance measuring tool, it appears the narrowest point there is 1.8 kilometers wide. NorthernGateway.ca tells me that our Douglas Channel is 1.4 kilometers uh, at its narrowest, 400 meters narrower than the place where we won't let the Americans run tankers through. There's talk, of course, of local pilots and escort tugs, but we've seen local pilots uh, fail to navigate our waters safely. Uh, and we've seen the escort tugs uh, up at uh, Prince William Sound. One of them ran into Bly Reef in 2009, the same spot that the Exxon Valdez had run into 20 years earlier. Uh, but I didn't think, I hope that I'm not bringing any new information with these things. And at one point I became discouraged and considered not addressing the panel at all. The government used an omnibus bill to shorten the time that the panel has to do its work, and it put the final decision into the hands of the governor and council. Governor and council, of course, being a body of this government, the uh, same government that has called the pipeline a national imperative and has called opponents of it radicals and enemies of Canada, it calls me these things. It seems to me that their decision is a foregone conclusion. So given the experts that have gone before me and my belief that the recommendations of the panel will have no bearing on the government's decision, I wondered why I should come here. But then I read again uh, the panel's procedural direction number five, which says the panel is interested in hearing your personal knowledge, views, or concerns, including who you are, how the project will impact you, your views on whether the project is in the public interest, your position on decisions the panel should make, and on terms or conditions that should be applied. So I thought, okay, my opinion is something I'm expert in. I'll, I'll bring that. I also read that the panel would consider sustainability to include socio-ecological integrity and civility, intra- and intergenerational equity, and democratic governance. If that is correct, and if I understand those things correctly, then perhaps my experience is illustrative of some of the reasons that this project should not go ahead. I started off my presentation with an acknowledgement of traditional Coast Salish territory. Uh, a short time ago, uh, that would not have crossed my mind. My grandfather came from Scotland in 1912 and fought overseas for Canada with the cavalry in World War I. He worked for a bank for a while and bought a farm in 1935. And my grandmother's family had been in Canada much longer, but they were all Scottish stock as well. My father worked in mines and then was a prospector my whole life. Uh, I grew up working in his office and working summers in camps in the Yukon in northern BC. I'm a tradesperson now, an electrical contractor. We Stevens have an appreciation of nature, um, but there are people that define ourselves by our work. And speaking for myself, nothing would make me angry faster than something getting in the way of work being done without a pretty good reason. I became aware of climate change, global warming, we called it back then, around the time Canada ratified Kyoto Protocol. And I did some reading on the subject, and the government seemed to be handling it, so I went back to work. Uh, then this Northern Gateway proposal came along, and I started paying attention again, and I realized that the government is not taking care of the climate change thing, quite, quite the opposite. I learned that it's already too late to keep average global warming to the two degrees that scientists think is the threshold of acceptable risk. I learned about ocean acidification and biodiversity loss and rising sea levels and food security and population growth and the inland benefits of the salmon cycle. I learned about the tar sands and the people of the Athabasca, and I began to learn about First Nations and treaties and unceded lands here in BC and the say that they can have in these issues. And I learned about my own family. I, I learned that my mother's side of the family, uh, which no one talks about when we were kids, 
Uh, it turns out her side of the family, five and six generations back, are all Métis and First Nations. I was shocked to learn that because I thought, how does a person grow up their whole life completely unaware of half of their heritage? But it seems that's a common story among the Anglo-Métis, the indigenous part of the family was just not talked about. And it seems to me that that's kind of a microcosm of Canada itself. The pipeline issue interconnects with all these other issues, and then Idle No More came along, and with the generous welcome of the Stalo people where I live in Chikoyak, Chilliwack, um, I learned that First Nations culture is not, as I had come to understand in school, a thing from the past, but it is alive as I am, and more so, perhaps, and that it will be vibrant long after I'm gone. Uh, over this period, my father has passed away, and a new baby came into our family. She's one year old. I'm here for her. Sorry, the babies. Anyway, so now back to the items from procedural direction number five. This is who I am now and the impact this pipeline has had on me. The Canada I thought I lived in has turned out to be a Eurocentric illusion. We don't have justice in this country, and we don't have a healthy democracy. <clears throat> the pipeline is only one small piece of all this, but it is a piece absolutely contrary to the public interest. It leads us on a path that is divisive and destructive and cannot be tolerated for the health of the land, and the sea, the air, or the country. <clears throat> Sorry. This panel should advise against this project, and knowing that the government means to ignore a recommendation against the project, the panel should demand conditions so onerous as to be impossible for the proponent to meet, or for the project to proceed without laying clear for all to see the treason of the government that allows it. Failing that, the pipeline will continue to impact me and my family as I continue to oppose it. To sit in front of the excavators if necessary, and to go to jail if necessary, as that is what I expect they do with people that place themselves in front of excavators. Even if the pipeline is rejected, as it should be, the impact on me has been profound with all of the issues that it has led me to learn about. For the sake of our young and our future generations, I have become, to some degree, the radical that my government prematurely accused me of being. I still have my contractor's license, but I haven't had time to use it lately. There's too much work to do. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for those comments. Ms. Evans, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to present your views to the panel. We're interested in understanding them. Please begin. Um, uh, thank you for hearing us. Um, and I also acknowledge that we are on unceded Coast Salish territory. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Anyways, you have had many learned people speak about all the reasons why we can't really afford to have this pipeline, and I'm sure you've had some that have told you why we should. Um, why big subsidies are given to the oil companies, but not so much to the renew renewable energy companies. Why once you go forward with this, you can't take the damage back. They have all said what I wanted to, but much more eloquently, and I'm much more eloquently than I ever could and in much more detail and knowledge. Um, I am not a foreign-funded radical, as the government would say anyone opposed to this pipeline is. I am an ordinary citizen. I have no degree. I am of Native and European heritage. I'm a mother and a nurse. Um, who has always tried to do her best to make the world a better place, even though I have people say, oh, there's nothing I can do, like, the government's just going to do it, but at least I'll be able to say that I can try and maybe I'll be able to say that I succeeded when I talked to my grandchildren. I have always felt lucky to live here. Many people move to this beautiful part of the world because it's much cleaner, the air and the water are much cleaner than where they come from, where they can't even see the stars, and they can't drink the water. Um, I'm appalled at the deg degradation in the environmental protection laws passed uh, most recently in Bill, uh, the Ob I can't say Ob Ob but it's C-38 or C-38 and C-35. Once the water is poisoned, we still don't have the technology to clean it up, and um, companies won't pay for it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be putting in the pipeline because the cost would be too great. My understanding is that the corrosion in the pipelines is easily detected, but the cracks 
can be. Uh, the machines would have to move too slowly over the uh, pipelines in a rugged terrain to actually detect it. It's just too hard. And that uh, anyhow, if there's cracks, uh, the pipelines, um, the volume of fluid that can leak out before it's detected by the technology that's in place is like 2% of the volume of the pipeline. That's a lot. And I've, I've been to meetings where co company pipelines for the pipelines down here, um, what's that one called? Yeah, the Kinder Morgan. Morgan, when they say, we rely on the citizens to tell us often when there's leak. That's where you come in. We all are in this together. And um, But I, a lot of this pipeline is going through remote areas where a leak would not be detected right away, but a lot of damage would be done before it is. Um, where I used to live up north, people that live there now say they can't drink the water due to, to, to fracking. Why would we allow companies that don't even allow us to know what is in the pipeline after people are exposed so that they can be treated, um, uh, put a pipeline through our province? Why are we risking the water so corporations can benefit? Why risk the health of our children and the lives of our future generations? Um, I know, okay, I can't read my right here. I know that um, this panel is not making the decisions, but I hope that the recommendations reflect that of the citizens and um, that the government will listen to what they have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you to each of you for taking the time to uh, prepare and to be here to present your oral statements to us. Thanks. Mr. Lovelace, please go ahead with your oral statement. Good afternoon. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Evan Lovelace, and I am the Executive Director of the Wilderness Tourism Association of British Columbia. I am here today representing BC's nature-based tourism industry. As an ind industry sector that relies on wildlife and pristine environments for our business success, the recommendations and decisions pertaining to the development of this pipeline project in British Columbia are of great concern to us. While individual tourism stakeholders will have a variety of reasons for opposing this project, many of which you've heard over the last, last months and weeks, our primary concerns and comments relate to the risks of the project and subsequent impacts to the BC's tourism industry from an oil spill. Our concerns relate to the, both the pipeline and the associated shipping along the BC coast by oil tankers. Simply put, we believe this project threatens our tourism industry. It is critical that the joint review panel considers the social economic activities related, related to the tourism and recreation that will be impacted in, in the event of an oil spill. Tourism contributes significantly to our local communities and the overall provincial economy. Nature-based tourism alone generates $1.6 billion for BC and approximately 25,000 jobs. It is also a major driver of BC's $13 billion plus tourism industry, an industry that generates over 125,000 direct jobs. Our tourism brand is Supernatural British Columbia. Over the many years, the province and industry have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in this brand, and tourism businesses support this brand by offering world-class travel experiences in wilderness settings. This is what draws tourists to British Columbia. Wildlife scenery and a pristine environment are BC's advantage in a very competitive international mar tourism market. 
At the same time, thousands of tourism businesses in British Columbia depend directly on a healthy natural environment for their tourism activities and product development. And not just wilderness tourism operators, hotels, restaurants, and other tourism services, even in urban areas, drive a large portion of their income from visitors attracted by the wildlife, natural beauty, and associated attractions unique to British Columbia. Without the child, the wilderness experience, such as catching a steelhead salmon, or viewing a grizzly bear, many travelers would very likely not visit British Columbia at all. Approximately 50% of our customers reside outside of Canada, making tourism, and in a sense, or nature, a key export industry for BC. Many British Columbians also spend their vacation dollars at home exploring their own province and enjoying these same values and features. It is for this reason that the tourism industry has put, put significant effort and resources toward the protection and stewardship of BC's environment, including the Great Bear Rainforest in our coast. A significant number of BC's tourism businesses operate along the proposed pipeline and tanker routes and would be directly affected by a spill. In fact, relatively few tourism operations in BC would be untouched by an oil spill in the province, wherever it may happen. The proposed pipeline would cross 1,500 water courses, including at least 600 fish-bearing streams in British Columbia. The project would cross through some of BC's most important salmon habitats, including the Upper Fraser and Skeena watersheds. Most of the terrain through northern BC where the pipeline route is proposed is considered unstable, and has a high potential to rupture the proposed pipeline. I can't imagine the oil product can be loaded on bulk tankers and will traverse some of the most dangerous coastline in the world with some of the richest ecosystems. We have examined the many studies and evidence presented by Enbridge, interveners, and other stakeholders of the probable frequency and consequences of spills. Any way you look at the evidence, an oil spill from a tanker incident or pipeline rupture is a certainty. There will be spills, and as you have heard many over, say over the past months, is not a question of if there will be a spill, but when. Industry best practices put forth by petroleum and shipping industries cannot and will not eliminate the chances of a spill. Human error can quickly lead to disaster, despite whatever industry best practices are, are in place. Even minor equipment failures can quickly lead to accidents. We have also considered the available and proposed spill response systems and resources and cleanup efforts and frankly find them inadequate. Oil spills in much of these environments is difficult to clean up and bitumen, as we have learned, is near impossible to contain and clean up. The implications of a pipeline rupture to fish and other wildlife would be devastating and river habitat could be threatened for decades. Subsequent cleanup efforts to stream and river processes would be insurmountable. The ability to properly respond to a pipeline rupture would be hindered by the remoteness of the areas, poor access, and other environmental factors. Any remedial actions in these freshwater systems could further cause long-term habitat impacts. The damage from a tanker spill would be catastrophic to wildlife, the environment, and the communities along much of the coast. After 23 years, even 23 years, 23 years after Alaska's Exxon Valdez spill, there is oil on the beaches of Prince William Sound. By all accounts, the port of Kitimat is the riskiest port if you wish to ship oil on BC's Pacific Coast. Any significant spill along the proposed pipeline route or tank route will have an immediate and significant impact on the tourism industry. It would destroy the wildlife that tourism businesses rely on for fishing, hunting, or viewing. It would foul the beaches that are used for camping and visiting or foul the waterways used to experience BC. Wildlife is a key factor for our industry's growth and prosperity, and the loss of wildlife from a spill would be a major blow. The loss of wildlife found within the first week after the Exxon Valdez spill was valued at $218 million. The loss of wildlife from that spill over the following weeks, months, and years, or the wildlife that died at sea or was not found, would be in the billions of dollars. Not only would the wildlife and other tourism recreation values in the, in the vicinity of the spill be directly affected. The spill would also impact the entire provincial tourism industry and much of the Canadian tourism industry due to the negative publicity it created. Many travelers who intended to include British Columbia in their travel plans would cancel or postpone visits to Canada. This has been realized in both the spill in Alaska and the recent Deep Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. In the Gulf, the entire region and beyond saw tourism visits and revenue plummet in the following year, in some, case, in, in some cases by 90%. Visits, inquiries, and online searches have dropped significantly since, and the region's tourism industry has struggled to survive. 
with many business failures and bankruptcies. Studies have also shown that the negative impact of oil spills lasts over a much longer period than the spill itself and subsequent cleanup efforts. The negative economic impacts of Deep Horizon spill are estimated to last for at least three years. The negative economic impact of the Exxon Valdez spill lasted more than three years, as has been the case with other spills. For British Columbia, our supernatural brand and the hundreds of millions of dollars of investment could be damaged perhaps forever. In summary, BC's tourism industry for, for BC's tourism industry to be successful, we need to protect our natural wilderness experiences and the supernatural brand that supports us. This will, however, will be impossible if our wildlife are lost and our waterways, beaches, and other features are rendered unusable, unusable due to an oil spill. Based on our analysis of this project, the nature of the probability of the spill from either a pipeline or a tanker, we have concluded that the risks associated with the project are unacceptably high and the associated impacts to BC's tourism industry are too great. When one weighs the total economic impact of the Northern Gateway project, there seems to be very little benefit from this project to British Columbians, but we will endure both the environmental and economic costs. Consequently, BC's tourism ministry is opposed to the Northern Gateway project. We urge your panel to consider the implications to BC's tourism ministry in your recommendations to the federal government. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Um, Ms. Mountain, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we'd like to hear your views on the project. Thank Please. you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity today to express my feelings and my concerns on the Ambridge Pipeline and Tanker proposal. Jacques Cousteau once said, for most of history, man has had to fight nature to survive. In this century, he is beginning to realize that in order to survive, he must protect it. I'm sitting here today because I know we can change. As Canadian citizens, we have the right and the responsibility to defend and protect our native home. I'm speaking on behalf of all the voiceless to demand change now. I'm sure you're already aware the effects of oil spills on people's communities and economies is pure devastation. In Michigan, the Kalamazoo River is still being cleaned up three years after a pipeline ruptured, spilling more than one million gallons of diluted bitumen. How many oil spills will it take to understand that this way of operating is not working? The Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska in 89, BP's Deepwater Horizon and the Michigan oil spills in 2010, and the Illinois and Buffalo New York oil spills in 2012 are consistent reminders of the urgency to move out of fossil fuels and into sustainable energy solutions. If the Northern Gateway oil pipeline was approved, another oil catastrophe would inevitably occur. Beautiful British Columbia would no longer be the best place on earth. It would not only destroy our entire coast, it would also destroy our people. As Canadian anthropologist Wade Davis states, this isn't just an environmental issue, it's a human rights issue too. Indigenous and other coastal communities depend on our coast for their survival because it is their culture, it is their traditional way of living. According to Canada's recently endorsed United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, these First Nations communities must give their consent before any project that is threatening their land or resources is approved. More than 70 First Nations signed a declaration opposing oil pipelines and tankers through BC. If the voices of the Indigenous are not enough to write off the proposal, even though ignoring these declarations would be a violation of international law, what is? 80% of British Columbians also oppose the super tankers in our waters, but to no avail, the proposal presses on. Native American Chief Seattle once said, the earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. The pipeline and super tanker proposal threatens the land and ocean that people depend on. It threatens my future job in the outdoor tourism industry because endangered wildlife and marine life, like the great whales, the spirit bear, and critical salmon habitats that BC is internationally recognized for are all at risk. It is threatening our humanity 
and our capacity to build a better future for our children. I want to make British Columbia my home, and I want to raise my family here. If the pipeline and tanker proposal is passed, what kind of future will my children have when an oil spill occurs in our waters? This is a crucial time in history. How can we expect to survive when we are continuously destroying the very foundation we depend on for our own survival? If we continue on this path, it will only lead to the destruction of life. It's time for renewable energy sources to curb our addiction to oil and support a carbon-free future for the next generation. It's time for green energy solutions that do not harm the earth and its people. It's time for change now before it's too late. As the saying goes, only when the last tree is cut down, the last fish eaten, and the last dream poisoned, will we realize that we cannot eat money. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Ms. McNamee? Ms. McNamee? Yeah. Um, we're here to hear your point of view. Please begin. I'm working on it. I started out thinking I should research some statistics and found some information that I'm not going to be able to say. Then I thought, no, you're supposed to make this personal. And I've got some things written down here that I'm not going to be able to say that either. And I started again and wrote, I stand with all the people of First Nations. I'm not going to be able to say that either. I guess I'll just say what is happening in our country around the environment makes me ashamed to be Canadian. Thank you. And thank you to uh, all three of you for taking the time to uh, to be here and to present your views to us. It's much appreciated.
Good afternoon. Thanks for taking the time to be here and to uh, express your views to us. Uh, let's start with ladies first. So, Ms. Martin, are you ready to proceed? Sure. Thanks. Um, thank you. So, my name is Teresa Martin, and I'm here to voice my opposition to the Embers Northern Gateway Pipeline. I'll start out with my personal perspective on this matter. I moved from southern Ontario five and a half years ago. Ironically, I grew up in a small town named Oil Springs, the first site in North America to strike oil back in the 1800s. It's located about half an hour outside of Sarnia, a city which bears the nickname Chemical Valley and is the southern Ontario hub of the petrochemical industry. My dad worked as a lab tech, taking multiple daily samples from the St. Clair River, where the refineries are legally allowed to release various chemicals into the water. That is, as long as they stay under a certain part per million. It is not all that surprising to me that Sarnia and the surrounding areas have an incredibly inflated cancer rate, including many rare cancers. I found several quotes of their rate being 34% higher than the provincial average. I moved out of the province in search of greener pastures, not to mention cleaner air. I quickly fell in love with British Columbia, the seemingly endless forest, the smell of the ocean, and a different set of values and ideals that the population of this province seems to hold dear. I decided to make this province my permanent home. The oil industry has managed to follow along, trying to rip through the heart of a province that knows better, that has seen its damages in the past and doesn't want to house its expansion. As I'm sure you have now noted, the opposition is strong, and there is strong, a strong reason for this. The reason being, our province is beautiful. I've traveled to many places. In my opinion, none parallel the beauty that we have here. I try to spend as much of my time surrounded in this beauty, in the outdoors, in a kayak, on a hike, or looking down into a valley from the top of a mountain. Seeing huge conifers house in temperate rainforests, species that ex exist nowhere else in the world, including what has become the anti-pipeline and tank tanker icon, the spirit bear and freshwater lakes and rivers where various species of salmon come to spawn. The beauty of this province is tied into the realization that there is interconnection with these species and ourselves. We are not willing to put this kind of beauty at risk of an oil spill. Humans have already pushed so many species to the brink of their habitats, and because they cannot speak for themselves, we need to speak for them. I don't think it is selfish of myself or of all the other British Columbians who share my opinion to speak up against this project to keep British Columbia beautiful. After all, our slogan is, the most beautiful place on earth. It is its beauty that has driven some of our real estate rates up to monstrous proportions, that creates a huge fishing industry and has brought so many tourists. The latter two industries would be gutted were there to be an oil spill on our coast. Not only do I post the project from a personal perspective, I feel I have a professional obligation as a registered nurse who has worked and will be working in remote First Nations communities in British Columbia to advocate on their behalf. The Northern Gateway Pipeline would have detrimental effects on the health of the First Nations people. I feel that the very motion of approving the project will